Greetings, gentlemen. I greet you here on the bank of the James River, in the year of our Lord, 1712. First, I shall thank you, the gentlemen of the colony of Virginia, for bringing me here. I am here to help you solve some of your problems with slaves. Your invitation reached me on my modest plantation in the West Indies, where I have experimented with some of the newest and still the oldest methods for control of slaves. Ancient Rome would envy us if my program is implemented. As our boat sailed south on the James River, named for our illustrious king whose version of the Bible we cherish, I saw enough to know that your problem is not unique. While Rome used cords of wood as crosses for standing human bodies along its highways in great numbers, you are here using the tree and the rope on occasions. I caught the whiff of a dead slave hanging from a tree a couple miles back. You are not only losing valuable stock by hangings, you are having uprisings, slaves are running away, your crops are sometimes left in the field too long for maximum profit, you suffer occasional fires, your animals are killed. Gentlemen, you know what your problems are. I do not need to elaborate. I am not here to enumerate your problems. I am here to introduce you to a method of solving them. In my bag here, I have a foolproof method for controlling your black slaves. I guarantee every one of you that if installed correctly, it will control the slaves for at least 300 years. My method is simple. Any member of your family or your overseer can use it. I have outlined a number of differences among the slaves, and I take these differences and make them bigger. I use fear, distrust, and envy for control purposes. These methods have worked on my modest plantation in the West Indies, and it will work throughout the South. Take this simple little list of differences and think about them. On top of my list is age but it's there only because it starts with an A. The second is color or shade. There is intelligence, size, sex, size of plantations, status on plantations, attitude of owners, whether the slaves live in the valley or on a hill, east, west, north, south, have fine hair, coarse hair, or is tall or short. Now that you have a list of differences, I shall give you an outline of action, but before that, I shall assure you that distrust is stronger than trust, and envy stronger than adulation, respect, or admiration. The black slaves, after receiving this indoctrination, shall carry on and will become self-refueling and self-generating for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. Don't forget, you must pitch the old black male versus the young black male and the young black male against the old black male. You must use the dark-skinned slaves versus the light-skinned slaves and the light-skinned slaves versus the dark-skinned slaves. You must use the female versus the male and the male versus the female. You must also have white servants and overseers who distrust all blacks. But it is necessary that your slaves trust and depend on us. They must love, respect, and trust only us. Gentlemen, these kits are your keys to control. Use them. Have your wives and children use them. Never miss an opportunity. If used intensely for one year, the slave themselves will remain perpetually distrustful. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's make a slave. It was the interest and business of slaveholders to study human nature and the slave nature in particular with a view to practical results. I and many of them attained astonishing proficiency in this direction. They had to deal not with earth, wood, and stone, but with men, and by every regard they had for their own safety and prosperity they needed to know the material on which they were to work, conscious of the injustice and wrong they were every hour perpetuating and knowing what they themselves would do. Were they the victims of such wrongs? They were constantly looking for the first signs of the dreaded retribution. They watched, therefore, with skilled and practiced eyes and learned to read with great accuracy the state of mind and heart of the slave through his sable face. Unusual sobriety, apparent abstractions, southernness and indifference indeed, any mood out of the common was afforded ground for suspicion and inquiry. Frederick Douglass, Let's Make a Slave, is a study of the scientific process of man-breaking and slave-making. It describes the rationale and results of the Anglo-Saxons' ideas and methods of ensuring the master-slave relationship. 
Let's make a slave the original and development of a social being called the Negro. Let us make a slave. What do we need? First of all, we need a black nigger man, a pregnant nigger woman, and her baby nigger boy. Second, we will use the same basic principle that we use in breaking a horse, combined with some more sustaining factors. What we do with horses is that we break them from one form of life to another. That is, we reduce them from their natural state in nature. Whereas nature provides them with the natural capacity to take care of their offspring, we break that natural string of independence from them and thereby create a dependency status so that we may be able to get from them useful production for our business and pleasure. Cardinal Principles for Making a Negro for fear that our future generations may not understand the principles of breaking both of the beasts together, the nigger and the horse. We understand that short-range planning economics results in periodic economic chaos, so that to avoid turmoil in the economy, it requires us to have breadth and depth in long-range comprehensive planning articulating both skill-sharp perceptions. We lay down the following principles for long-range comprehensive economic planning. Both horse and niggers are no good to the economy in the wild or natural state. Both must be broken and tied together for orderly production. For orderly future, special and particular attention must be paid to the female and the youngest offspring. Both must be crossbred to produce a variety and division of labor. Both must be taught to respond to a peculiar new language. Psychological and physical instruction of containment must be created for both. We hold the six cardinal principles as truth to be self-evident, based upon following the discourse concerning the economics of breaking and tying the horse and the nigger together, all inclusive of the six principles laid down above. Note, neither principle alone will suffice for good economics. All principles must be employed for orderly good of the nation. Accordingly, both a wild horse and a wild or natural nigger is dangerous even if captured for they will have the tendency to seek their customary freedom and in doing so might kill you in your sleep. You cannot rest. They sleep while you are awake and are awake while you are asleep. They are dangerous near the family house and it requires too much labor to watch them away from the house. Above all, you cannot get them to work in this natural state. Hence, both the horse and the nigger must be broken. That is, breaking them from one form of mental life to another. Keep the body, take the mind. In other words, break the will to resist. Now, the breaking process is the same for both the horse and the nigger, only slightly varying in degrees. But as we said before, there is an art in long-range economic planning. You must keep your eye and thoughts on the female and the offspring of the horse and the nigger. A brief discourse in offspring development will shed light on the key to sound economic principles. Pay little attention to the generation of original breaking, but concentrate on future generation. Therefore, if you break the female mother, she will break the offspring in its early years of development and when the offspring is old enough to work, she will deliver it up to you for her normal female protective tendencies will have been lost in the original breaking process. For example, take the case of the wild stud horse, a female horse and an already infant horse and compare the breaking process with two captured nigger males in the natural state, a pregnant nigger woman with her infant offspring. Take the stud horse. Break him for limited containment. Completely break the female horse until she becomes very gentle, whereas you or anybody can ride her in her comfort. Breed the mare and the stud until you have desired offspring. Then you can turn the stud to freedom until you need him again. Train the female horse whereby she will eat out of your hand and she will in turn train the infant horse to eat out of your hand also. When it comes to breaking the uncivilized nigger, use the same process but vary the degree and step up the pressure so as to do a complete reversal of the mind. Take the meanest and most restless nigger, strip him of his clothes in front of the remaining male niggers, the female and the nigger infant, tar and feather him, tie each leg to a different horse faced in opposite directions, set him afire and beat both horses to pull him apart in front of the remaining niggers. This next step is to take a bullwhip and beat the remaining nigger males to the point of death in front of the female and the infant. Don't kill him. 
but put the fear of God in him for he can be useful for future breeding. Earlier, we talked about the non-economic good of the horse and the nigger in the wild or natural state. We talked about the principle of breaking and tying them together for orderly production. Furthermore, we talked about paying particular attention to the female savage and her offspring for orderly future planning. Then more recently, we stated that by reversing the positions of the male and female savages, we created an orbiting cycle that turns on its own axis forever unless a phenomena occurred and reshifts positions of the male and female savages. Our experts warned us about the possibility of this phenomena occurring, for they say that the mind has a strong drive to correct and recorrect itself over a period of time if it can touch some substantial original historical base. And they advised us that the best way to deal with the phenomena is to shave off the brute's mental history and create a multiplicity of phenomena of illusions so that each illusion will twirl in its own orbit something similar to floating balls in a vacuum. This creation of multiplicity of phenomena of illusions entails the principle of crossbreeding the nigger and the horse, as we stated above, the purpose of which is to create a diversified division of labor, thereby creating different levels of labor and different values of illusion at each connecting level of labor. The results of which is the severance of the points of original beginnings for each sphere illusion. Since we feel that the subject matter may get more complicated as we proceed in laying down our economic plan concerning the purpose, reason, and effect of crossbreeding horses and niggers, we shall lay down the following definition terms for future generations. Orbiting cycle means a thing turning in a given path. Axis means upon which or around which a body turns. Phenomena means something beyond ordinary conception and inspires awe and wonder. Multiplicity means a great number, means a globe. Crossbreeding a horse means taking a horse and breeding it with an ass and you get a dumb, backward, ass, long-headed mule that is not reproductive nor productive by itself. Crossbreeding niggers means taking so many drops of good white blood and putting them into as many, as many nigger women as possible, varying the drops by the various tone that you want, and then letting them breed with each other until another circle of color appears as you desire. What this means is this. Put the niggers and the horse in a breeding pot, mix some asses and some good white blood, and what do you get? You got a multiplicity of colors of ass-backward, unusual niggers running tied to backward-ass, long-headed mules, the one productive of itself, the other sterile. The one constant, the other dying. We keep the nigger constant for we may replace the mules for another tool. Both mule and nigger tied to each other, neither knowing where the other came from and neither productive for itself nor without each other. Take the female and run a series of tests on her to see if she will submit to your desires willingly. Test her in every way because she is the most important factor for good economics. If she shows any sign of resistance and submitting completely to your will, do not hesitate to use the bullwhip on her to extract that last bit of bitch out of her. Take care not to kill her, for in doing so you spoil good economics. When in complete submission, she will train her offsprings in the early years to submit to labor when they become of age. Understanding is the best thing. Therefore, we shall go deeper into this area of the subject matter concerning what we have produced here in this breaking process of the female nigger. We have reversed the relationship in her natural, uncivilized state. She would have a strong dependency on the uncivilized nigger male, and she would have a limited protective tendency toward her independent male offspring and would raise male offsprings to be dependent like her. Nature had provided for this type of balance. We reverse nature by burning and pulling a civilized nigger apart and bullwhipping the other to the point of death all in her presence. By her being left alone, unprotected, with the male image destroyed, the ordeal caused her to move from psychologically dependent state of, to a frozen independent state. In this frozen psychological state of independence, she will raise her male and female offspring in reversed roles. For fear of the young male's life, she will psychologically train him to be mentally weak and dependent, but physically strong. Because she has become psychologically independent, she will train her female offsprings to be psychologically independent. What have you got? You've got the nigger woman out front and the nigger man behind and scared. 
This is a perfect situation of sound sleep and economics. Before the breaking process, we had to be alertly on guard at all times. Now we can sleep soundly, for out of frozen fear, his woman stands guard for us. He cannot get past her early slave voting process. He is a good tool, now ready to be tied to the horse at a tender age. By the time a nigger boy reaches the age of 16, he is soundly broken in and ready for a long life of sound and efficient work and the reproduction of a unit of a good labor force. Continually, through the breaking of uncivilized savage niggers, by throwing the nigger female savage into a frozen psychological state of independence, by killing the protective male image, and by creating a submissive dependent mind of the nigger male slave, we have created an orbiting cycle that turns on its own axis forever, unless a phenomenon occurs and reshifts the position of the male and female slaves. We show what we mean by example. We breed two nigger males with two nigger females. Then we take the nigger male away from them and keep them moving and working. Say one nigger female bears a nigger female and the other bears a nigger male. Both nigger females, being without influence of the nigger male image, frozen with an independent psychology, will raise their offspring into reverse positions. The one with the female offspring will teach her to be like herself, independent and negotiable. We negotiate with her, through her, by her, negotiates her at will. The one with the nigger male offspring, she being frozen in, an, in a subconscious fear for his life, will raise him to be mentally dependent and weak but physically strong. In other words, body over mind. Now in a few years, when these two offsprings become fertile for early reproduction, we will mate and breed them and continue the cycle. That is good, sound, and the severance from their original beginning. We must completely annihilate the mother tongue of both the new nigger and the new mule and institute a new language that involves the new life's work of both. You know, language is a peculiar institution. It leads to the heart of a people. The more a foreigner knows about the language of another country, the more he is able to move through all levels of that society. Therefore, if the foreigner is an enemy of the country, to the extent that he knows the body of the language, to that extent is the country vulnerable to attack or invasion of a foreign culture. For example, you take a slave, if you teach him all about your language, he will know all your secrets, and he is then no more a slave, for you can't fool him any longer, and being a fool is one of the basic ingredients of any incidents to the maintenance of the slavery system. For example, if you told a slave that he must perform in getting out our crops and he knows the language well, he would know that our crops didn't mean our crops and the slavery system would break down for he would relate on the basis of what our crops really meant. So you have to be careful in setting up the new language for the slaves would soon be in your house talking to you as man to man and that is death to our economic system. In addition, the definitions of words or terms are only a minute part of the process. Values are created and transported by communication through the body of the language. A total society has many interconnected value systems. All the values in the society have bridges of language to connect them for orderly working in the society. But for these language bridges, these many value systems would sharply clash and cause internal strife or civil war, the degree of the conflict being determined by the magnitude of the issues or relative opposing strength in whatever form. For example, if you put a slave in a hog pen and train him to live there and incorporate in him to value it as a way of life completely, the biggest problem you would have out of him is that he would worry you about provisions to keep the hog pen clean or the same hog pen and make a slip and incorporate something in his language whereby he comes to value a house more than he does his hog pen. You got a problem. Obama. He will soon be in your house. The lost cause interpretation of the war is the Confederate memory of the coming of the war and the progress of the war. And there are several elements that are absolutely central to how former Confederates remembered this conflict. They had to come away from an all-encompassing defeat, a shattering defeat, with some way to keep their honor intact and to hold their heads high. And so they argued first that it hadn't really been about slavery. Uh, they knew they were out of step. The Confederacy was the slaveholding Confederacy with the tide of Western civilization on slavery. And so they said it wasn't about slavery. It was about a constitutional principle. It was about which side uh, were the true inheritors of the uh, 
legacy of the founding generation, and they said they were. In addition to moving slavery uh, out of a central position in their memory of the war, the Lost Cause architects also argued that it was a war that they never could have won. It was a hopeless war from the beginning because of overwhelming Union advantages of men and material. Uh, there was no loss of honor in, in a gallant struggle against hopeless odds, and so that's how they presented themselves. They also focused on Robert E. Lee because Lee was the best card they could play. He was the most important Confederate during the war. You could talk about Lee without talking about slavery. You could emphasize that he and his Army of Northern Virginia won very famous victories against the longest of odds as they did at Chancellorsville. Uh, Lee was a very pious man. Uh, he, he never uh, uh, blew his own horn, very self-effacing. And so with Lee, they had an excellent person to put forward as the most important Confederate. So it's not about slavery. It was a hopeless struggle against the odds. But under the leadership of Robert E. Lee, they put up a really staunch and valiant struggle, supported on the home front by women who were loyal, white women who were loyal to the cause, and by slaves who were also loyal to the cause. So in the Lost Cause version, your Confederate population is gallant soldiers, uh, devoutly loyal women behind the lines, and slaves who were really on board with what their masters were trying to do. Now, I want to go beyond that and look at the Confederate government's behavior during the Civil War, which would shed additional light on their purpose. And what I submit to you as my personal view is that the behavior of the Confederacy in several key areas demonstrates that Confederate leaders were more concerned about preserving slavery than they were, unbelievably, than in winning the war, than in winning the war and preserving their independence, that it was all about slavery. Um, and so what, what are the kinds of things I'm talking about? Well, the first is a fairly controversial area, the rejection of using slaves as soldiers. Now you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've heard that there were some slaves fighting for the South. Uh, I mean, look, just in 2010, uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, well known for the accuracy of its school textbooks, uh, <laughs> published a book that said 2,000 blacks fought under the command of Stonewall Jackson. And so when challenged on it, the department person who had come up with this addition to the text said, oh, that was on the internet. That's it. So, that's, I mean, it sounds like a good source. You could have at least said it was Wikipedia, but now, now it was on the it was on the internet. So that was that was the source of that. The first thing that the Lost Cause does is argue that the war was not really about slavery. What they argue is instead what the war was really about were things like the tariff or states' rights. Um, less a clash of political sections than one of two different cultures. And we've seen this play out in some of what we've done in class. Um, they also make the argument that, first of all, slavery was not profitable, which we know was not the case. And then they also make the argument that the real blame for the war should be placed at the feet of abolitionists. Abolitionists like... John Brown, right, exactly. Abolitionists like John Brown, whose fanaticism prompted this conflict and provoked this conflict. And they rationalize, the last thing that they do is, is part of this lost cause, is rationalize the losses on the battlefield by arguing that they never had a chance, that the North had such an overwhelming superiority of resources that they were, it was inevitable, they could be crushed by that. And we know that's basically actually true. But the, the lost cause also really minimizes any kind of internal dissent or internal conflicts that might have contributed to it. And so the result is this idealized Confederate home front with faithful slaves and patriotic women and committed soldiers. This fall, students in Texas are going to start using history textbooks that say that the Civil War was primarily about states' rights and not slavery. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the textbooks are part of a new history curriculum that, according to the Washington Post, does not mention, does not even mention the Ku Klux Klan or Jim Crow laws. Is it time for a new reconstruction in the South? 
Well, the, the reconstruction of the South is taking place on its own. It's taking place because of, of a demographic shift, Tom. Uh, that reconstruction, that's the only way it'll take place. And I, I, I have to tell you this. I, there was a time when I would talk to you about this topic, and I would say that their generational shift will make a difference. But this, this, this is, uh, you have young people, you have millennials, aged people coming up in the, in the South, that this has just skipped a generation. This, this racism, this type of thing we saw in South Carolina has just jumped from grandparent to parent to child. So it is going to take a racial demographic change really to have any effect on that. Uh, I think, as I've always said, uh, turn the lights out on the South. If you're progressive, don't worry about it. Uh, move on to, to a place where we can build until those racial demographics shift. And even then, understand there's not going to be anything really meaningful, I mean, across the board, when you have this hatred, when you have this, 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 this deep-seated hatred that's been passed on from generation to generation where we're, we're concerned about the man who's black or the, the Mexican-American and they're different from us and they scare us. That is simply part of the Southern mentality. I've been, I was raised down here all my life. I feel like I, I'm free to be able to say this. I, I think I understand it very, very well. And so we, we, get so we get so caught up in believing we can change all that. I'm telling you, my observation is it will not change until there's a racial demographic change, not even a generational. When does slavery end? And the answer is it didn't. As long as you have one person mistreating another, you have slavery. That's all slavery is. One person mistreating another. If I go out here and mistreat someone right now, during the period that that person is being mistreated, even if it's for five minutes, that person is my slave. Why? Because the person is being mistreated. Slavery is nothing but synonymous with mistreatment. There's no such thing as slavery ending until mistreatment ends. For so, white supremacy is a slave system. So the question now is, also, do we have white supremacy? The answer to that question is, according to the evidence, yes. yes. So therefore, slavery didn't end because white supremacy didn't end. So yes, that person is guilty suspected of being guilty. That's the way you say it when you use words, because there's no way you can prove that the person is guilty. You've got nobody to prove it by. But, but suspected. you say, you are, if you're white, and you're able to practice racism, you should be suspected mm -hmm. of being a racist, okay. if you're able to be one. Mm -hmm. okay, right now, in 2017, mm -hmm. on this planet. Why? Logically speaking, because the only system of government on the planet is the system of white supremacy. There's yeah. no other form of, of government. So any white person who is able to be a racist probably is one. You can't prove this person is one, but you can't prove this person is not one. All right? So that makes the person a what? Racist suspect. Sus suspect, yeah. Right. I wish That's the term. Would racist you... suspect. Okay. Never call a white person a racist. Why? Because you have no way of proving it. Okay. Don't yeah.